What's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast. We're going to drag Phil Perry in in just a minute. He's in Indianapolis, where on this Tuesday morning, Elliot Wolf, the Patriots, let's call him general manager, de facto or otherwise, spoke to the media today. Now, we're going to play the entirety of the Elliot Wolf interview. But before we do, I want to highlight just a couple of things you're going to hear from him. He's going to speak on the quarterback group. He'll say, it looks like they are all tough individuals and quote, we have to determine who can handle being quarterback of the new England Patriots. To me, that's a huge component. The resiliency, this is not Elliot, this is me. Um, the resiliency and the intangibles are absolutely vital because if you drop a guy into a situation and he can't deal with the heat in that particular kitchen, he's going to throw his apron and not be able to succeed. Um, he was asked about body language. You'll hear that question as well. And he said, it's important to players on the team to have a leader who is composed. You don't want hands being thrown up. Strike, Mac. On pending free agents, Elliot Wolf was asked about Kyle Duggar and Mike Nwenu. And his answer was interesting in that he said he wants to keep both players, Patriots do, and that they will work with Kyle's agent and with Mike Nwenu reportedly this week. Fired his agents, so saying that they're working with Mike and not Mike's agents. Little nugget in there that you can perhaps infer into if they're dealing directly with Mike and Wenu. Agents are always going to try and get the biggest bang for the buck, regardless of outposts they're sending their guy to. So maybe a one who said, you know what, I'm just staying here in New England. I really don't need an agent. Um, how does... Wolf's philosophy differ. You're going to hear him talk about playing young players and developing from within, which is something the Patriots absolutely have to do, and they probably would have loved to have done had they drafted better in the last few years. But maybe we'll see fewer detentions for players like Demario Douglas or uh, anyone who happens to have a gaffe or a mistake. Wolf also confirmed that while it's a collaboration, the buck has to stop somewhere and he will make the pick. Elliot Wolf will make the final decision on personnel stuff. Certainly not on game day. You have to understand all these different departments will have different aspects, but the collaboration was stressed first, but he will definitely mention that. Um, some conversation with Wolf, you'll hear about his time as a young kid when he was tagging along with his dad, Ron Wolf being around the combine and how it's changed. What to expect from a Patriots team now? And this is where Wolf gets into a little bit of differentiating from the Patriots we've come to know, respect. He said, we need to weaponize the offense, and we also need to be faster and more explosive on defense. Everybody's looking to be faster and more explosive on defense. There's not a team out there that's looking to be slower and less explosive, more muted, none of them. But saying that you're going to weaponize the offense, you ain't got no weapons now. So maybe an arms buildup. Free agent pitch, he's asked about that. New program, headed in a new direction. Mayo is awesome. That's how they're going to pitch guys. So again, distancing from what we had seen. Um, he was asked about Robin Glazer. The much-discussed Patriots executive said that she is involved in continuing as legal counsel contracts. Things like uh, making sure that you're in accordance with league dictates on getting things in on time, um, the language of things, cap compliance, HR compliance, interview compliance, again, Despite the sexiness of the conversation, Robin Glazer is not going to be breaking down slot receivers for the draft. Suck tax. Phil asked about it. I've been talking about it. How much are the Patriots going to have to pay that to free agents? Wolf will discuss that. And also, what will the owner's opinions be and will they be swaying to the team? Wolf said, quote, they prefer to stay out of football. I think that they have opinions which they'll share. He also adds that the Patriots grading system under Bill Belichick, out. They have a new one. It's going to be the 
hacker way now in terms of the grading system. And they will hear a lot more from the scouts than they have in the past. So a lot of differentiation, a lot of differentiation between the way they're going to do their business in building this team and the way they've done their business. Despite the six Super Bowls, the nine Super Bowl appearances, the greatest dynasty in NFL history, modern times, Super Bowl era, or otherwise, the Patriots continue to chart a course that's far different from that and announcing it. And the final was, what is the Packer way? Honesty, respect, and treating people the right way. These are shots across the bow for Bill Belichick. And it's unseemly. Got a, they got, they, they, they're not doing a good job of uh, soft-shoeing around saying that the guy was really friggin' good. And nobody has spent more time, you know, trying to call it like I see it, but being critical of Bill's drafting, bedside manner, free agency signings, coaching decisions, roster decisions. Nobody was over the last five years. But the continued word choice that asks you to draw an inference of, well, how did that change from what we saw? Eh, a little too much, a little too much grave dancing going on. And I know that I get accused of it plenty on social media, which is oftentimes a cesspool anyway, and people are just keeping their days moving along by sitting online going, but they got to do a better job of paying heed and respect to what proceeded, regardless of how the last four years went and how frustrated guys might be. All right, hit it, Elliot Wolf. Let's hear him in full. I hope I didn't give you too many spoilers. Can you just take us through the process of how you wound up here and, you know, being in the position now that you are? Yeah, uh, you know, thanks for the question. I think uh, I want to thank Robert and Jonathan Kraft for this tremendous opportunity that's been bestowed upon me. Um, you know, continue to work together with Gerard Mayo. It's been really exciting so far. And Matt Groh, Richard Miller, all the people that kind of make the Patriots go behind the scenes over the years. And uh, it's a... It's going to be a lot of work, and we're really excited to kind of get going here and um, try to help improve the team and get us back to respectability. What's your title, Elliot? Uh, my title is Director of Scouting. Hey, Elliot, what did your time in Green Bay mean to you to help you get here? Yeah, my time in Green Bay meant everything. Um, it's where uh, I learned my foundation of scouting, leadership, how to treat people, how to deal with people, uh, really just everything in terms of the business of football. Um, and it's prepared me for this moment to, to help the New England Patriots get back to where we need to go. Hey, Elliot, uh, you know, when you look back at your time with the Packers, you watch a ton of film and you were, you know, kind of the founding guy for Greg Jennings, Devontae Adams. I'm curious to hear, you know, your thoughts on Marvin Harrison. When you watch his film, what's the first thing that pops out about his film? Yeah, well, uh, those players that you mentioned that we had with Green Bay, uh, it wasn't me, it was a collaborative effort. Um, and we were we were really excited to get those guys, and they've obviously you know Greg was a great player, and Devonte continues to you know break records, and and eventually he'll be getting the gold jacket. Um, uh, thanks for the question about Marvin. Like he's a good player. Um, obviously, there's a lot of strengths to his game, and um, he can translate into any offense in the NFL. Hey Elliot, the Bills have won several division titles in a row. When you look at them and, and, and trying to compete with them, what stands out about the way Brandon has built that team? Yeah, uh, Brandon Bean's done a great job with those guys. Um, you know, they obviously have Josh Allen. They have tremendous weapons on offense. They have a, a really good defensive scheme. And, uh, you know, we'll be able to compete with them as we move forward here. Um, you know, the they've done a great job drafting, and that's something that, that we're going to continue to try to do. Hello, you've got, you've got yeah. Mac Jones and Bailey Zabby on our contract and the number three pick. Um, where are you guys in deciding what you're going to do in quarterback moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say there's a lot of options on the table. Um, uh, I'm glad you asked about Mac and Bailey. Um, we're not, we're not going to be a program that's talking about these guys in terms of, uh, you know, through the media. We're gonna, we're gonna do what's best for the team behind the scenes, and and uh, the strategy of that is gonna be uh, myself, Gerard Mayo, Macro, and we're gonna try to. Uh, try to do the right thing for for the team. Elliot, there's a report that Michael Wenyu has uh, fired his agent. Does that 
concern you at all? How does that impact you guys moving forward when it comes to uh, dealing with it? it? It doesn't impact us. Mike's a core player for us that, that you know, it's no secret we want to try to keep Mike. Um, and it'll just be a little bit of a wrinkle dealing with him. Uh, Mike's really smart and he's introspective and he's thoughtful and he understands, you know, he knows what he wants, which is always good when you're dealing with the player. Um, and, and he's certainly someone that you know, we, we view as a cornerstone for us. What do you think of the quarterbacks in this year's class from what you've seen, and are any of them worthy of the number three overall pick? I think it's a really good year for quarterbacks. Um, it's a really good year at a lot of positions. Uh, like any position, we're gonna, we're gonna evaluate their strengths and weaknesses, determine who fits for us. We're pretty early in the process here. Like, I haven't met any of these guys, Gerard hasn't met any of these guys, so you know, as we continue through the process here, we'll, we'll determine um, what's best for the team. And, you know, one thing uh, about the quarterbacks in this draft specifically that, that I'm excited about is they all look like they're really tough guys, which, you know, is obviously great at any position, but the quarterback position especially. How do you try to gauge mental toughness? You could probably see toughness on the film in some ways, but how do you try to gauge that and how important is this week to trying to figure that out? Um, I don't know how important this week is for that specifically, but I think it's about talking to the right people and asking the right questions. And when we meet with them, asking the right questions. And that may be here in a formal interview. That may be, you know, at a later date at the pro day or, or wherever that may be. But we, we have to determine, you know, who, who can handle being the quarterback of the New England Patriots. You get to know a new staff of assistant coaches. How do you sort through and learn which of them are, are good scouts and which maybe aren't as good? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I think the key is just having open and honest meetings and dialogue. Um, we had a, a series of meetings last week that were tremendous for us as we all got on the same page in terms of, you know, what our team needs are. And I was actually really encouraged by everybody willing to just say their opinion, even if it was different from the previous person. So, you know, having those open, honest meetings and, and working together to determine the best outcome is is definitely what's important. Have what you found in the past, like, you know this guy's particularly good at this, you know that guy's maybe not great at that and applied it accordingly? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, you know, I, th I think part of being in a leadership position is understanding the strengths and weaknesses of everybody in the building, and, and that includes myself. Like, I have strengths, I have weaknesses, and it's important to be able to supplement, you know, your team with, with people who can, you know, feed off of each other. When you're evaluating quarterbacks, what, what attributes do you value the most? Uh, good question. Um, you know, first of all, being a being someone that can elevate his teammates, someone that your teammates want to play for. I think that's an extremely underrated thing that people don't really talk about that much. Um, leadership's important, and obviously, you know, physical talent. We wouldn't be talking about these guys if they weren't physically talented. Oh, you you how, much, how much emphasis do you place on body language, and have you ever thought about using like outside agencies to, you know, evaluate the quarterbacks? Uh, body language on the field is very important at that position. You know, you don't want a guy that's throwing his hands up after a bad play, or you can you can see him physically, you know, pointing at somebody, or you know, body language is important. Everybody's looking to the quarterback. Um, and as far as outside agencies, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Like how they have personality tests and, and to see like how this personality matches with others, those types of things. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have a lot of tests that we use and resources like that. Um, I don't know if there's one specific to body language that we utilize. What do we anticipate using the franchise tag either on Mike or Kyle? Uh, I would say that all the, all the options are on the table. Um, we definitely want to keep Mike and Kyle, and you know we're hopeful to continue to work with with Kyle's agent and Mike to uh, to make that happen. Well, I would say your roster building philosophy and system that you want to implement will differ from the system you've been a part of the last four years. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Just your roster building philosophy and system, how will that you know show itself as being most different from the system you were a part of the last four years? Yeah, I think there's, there's going to be a little bit more reliance on playing young players. I think it's really important in today's football to be able to play young players and develop from within. When you have you are you open to possibly trading the number three pick? And have you fielded any calls uh, in that light? Yeah, I would say all, all options are on the table, and we haven't heard anything specifically. When it comes to chain of command, Elliot, as you understand it, who is responsible when it comes to that number three pick? Who ultimately makes the call? Uh, it's going to be a collaborative effort. Coach Mayo, myself, Matt Grow, the whole staff. Um, at the end of the day, somebody has to has to make that pick, and, and that'll be myself. Elliot, you mentioned some of the traits and quarterbacks that are important to you. We're coming off a Super Bowl where one team found their quarterback top of the draft, the other at the bottom. How have you changed in your, the way you evaluate quarterbacks or the traits that you might prioritize over the last 10 years or so? 
Yeah, I think uh, when you look throughout the league, that's a good question. I think when you look throughout the league, most of the quarterbacks are first rounders. Um, I think there's exceptions to be had, like you know Dak Prescott, Brock Purdy, and Tom Brady. Um, but I think just the the league wide understanding of how important that position is and how important it is to have somebody there that can help you, you know, win games and get over the hump has has changed league wide. Why do you think, why do you think the Packers keep getting the quarterback right? Why do I think the Packers keep getting the quarterback right? Your time there. Luck. <laughs> no, I I think uh, I think the scouting process that you know that I grew up with that Brian Gutekunst continues to to em- employ is has been really good and you know they've been able fortunate enough to to you know sit sit Rogers and sit Love for a year that and that that's been able to help them. I wouldn't say that that applies to every quarterback, but it certainly helps them. Elliot, your father was an obvious mentor for you. What are some of the lessons um, that he taught you that you still are still guiding you today? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of scouting itself, it's just kind of trust what you see and believe in it. Um, but also, also really lessons about people. Um, I still believe, and, and this is great to, to be able to work with Gerard, who also believes this. This is a people business, and it's about developing people. And the culture is created from the people in your building, whether that's scouts, coaches, players, support staff. And I think that's tremendously important uh, as, as you try to build a culture that you want. Elliot, I think Gerard said you guys have cash to burn. Do you, do you plan on being aggressive in free agency? Uh, we're going to aggressively try to help the team uh, take that however you want it. But we will, we will try to do what's right, whether that means spending or saving. We'll uh, TBD. Elliot, just kind of curious, given your football life and, and who your dad was, what was your first trip to the Combine and, and what do you remember about it? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So my first trip to the Combine was uh, 1993. I was 10 years old. This is my 30th Combine. Um, I've been every year except for the 2021 when they didn't have it. Um, the Combine now is so much more organized than it used to be. I mean, the workout was supposed to start at, at 10 uh, back in the 90s, and maybe it would start at 1, and everyone would be sitting in the dome the whole time. It was, it was crazy. The, there were no formal interview times. It was like a big scrum of people grabbing guys there were scouts and coaches fighting each other because they wanted to interview somebody next like it was it was kind of wild um but it's uh, a credit to jeff foster and, and the league and and uh nfs to to putting this thing together what was 10 year old you doing here i was uh i was really just kind of dipping my toes into scouting and, and watching the workouts and evaluating um, my dad used to sit down at the start of the 40s and it was it was him bill parcells and al davis and i was just sitting there like soaking it all up like it was it was just tremendously rewarding in a, in a, you know, kind of as I look back on it, it was, you know, definitely a special time. Elliot, what should Patriots fans expect from an Elliot Wolf-led personnel department? Like, what, what do you believe in as far as building a team? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I think the main thing is just uh, getting players that fit our culture, um, getting players that want to do right, want to do the extra. But in terms of just physical, physical skills, uh, we need to weaponize the offense. We need to be faster and more explosive on defense, and you know, height, weight, speed, um, playmaking ability. There'll be definitely an emphasis on those things. Elliot, what's your what's your pitch to free agents as you guys sort of navigate this rebuilding period? Pitch to free agents. Yeah. Yeah, I would say our pitch to free agents is, you know, this is a new program, and we're we're heading in the right direction. It's a new era. We have leadership with Gerard Mayo that is going to be tremendous. Like he's. He's just an unbelievable leader and developer of people, and I think that, you know, as we move forward with the new offense and defense, like, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty special and exciting here. Elliot, what are some ways that uh, Robin Glazer has been helping out you and the football team in general? Yeah, Robin's been a good resource for everyone. Um, she continues in her role as uh, as chief legal counsel, and uh, she's been helpful uh, with some of the day-to-day behind-the-scenes things that need to get taken care of. What, what are you hoping Elliot, to? You, think, you know, you were just asked about your pitch to free agents. Questions at quarterback. The team hasn't been very good the last couple of years. Do you think you'll have to pay a tax in some ways for free agents to encourage them to come to New England? Yeah, in some ways, but I think that's kind of free agency as a whole. Like, you know, you can teams can put their best recruiting pitch on and you know, at the end of the day, like a lot of times they'll go to whoever's offering them the most money. So what are you hoping to accomplish this week? Uh, well, that's a good question too. Like the, the amount of information that we get here is just so tremendous. Not only the timing and testing, you know, the measurements, the body types, the the jumps, and all those things, but we get all the medical information. We get to meet with 45 guys formally and uh, countless others informally, um, talking to agents, getting information, talking to play, to, 
to front office people and other teams and scouts and just the amount of information that we can accumulate in a week is awesome and and it's really a credit to the city of indianapolis the way this thing's set up too because everything is like right here and so you know it was 70 degrees out yesterday but there's no need to go outside here because everything's just kind of connected but no, it's 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 a it's still a, a really great resource for us. Billy, with the cap space that you guys have in the third overall pick, how involved do you anticipate ownership will be in making some of these big decisions for you guys this offseason? Yeah, I mean they 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 prefer to stay out of football, but um, they're they've been very supportive of Gerard and, and myself and and Matt and you know it, anything we need, we've got in in a lot of ways. So um, I think they have opinions which they'll share, but. Ultimately, it's it's down to Gerard and I. Elliot, have you guys changed? Have you and Alonzo changed the grading system and that you guys are using? I mean, why are you doing that? What do you think the advantages are? Yeah, so uh, we, we changed the grading system. It's a little bit uh, more similar to what we did in Green Bay. Um, the the previous Patriot system was more. This is what the role is, and this is more kind of value based. So I think it it makes it a lot easier for scouts to rate guys and, and put them in a stack of like this guy's the best this guy's the worst and and everything in between falls into place rather than sort of more nuanced approaches i, I just think it makes it, it it accounts value better and it also makes it easier for the scouts in the fall as well as in the spring to determine where guys will get drafted does alonzo have a title uh senior personnel executive so just to clarify the new system won't be as role specific like all receivers will be will be sort of ranked together all you know running backs will be ranked together even if the roles might end up being different yeah in, in a sense I mean we'll still have slot receivers and perimeter receivers things like that it's to me it's a little bit less about the grading scale and more about the process that we're going that we've put in place um, this process is, is is a lot more collaborative we hear from the scouts more we're going to be able to uh, determine you know together like what's the best thing for the team at the, at the end of the day how labor intensive is that to change a grading system for an entire organization uh you know it, it's actually been really encouraging the scouts have been really open to it and they're trying and you know some guys have been here for 20 years with the old system so again i, I think it's again let it's it's to, for me it's a lot less about the grading scale and more about the process of of determining you know, who the best player for the Patriots is. Elliot, how big was the influence was Ted and some of those other guys that you worked with in Green Bay? And also obviously a heck of a front office that's more over there. Yeah, the front office I worked with in Green Bay was phenomenal. I mean, just when I look back at those times, like the amount of guys that have gone on to great success in this league. And Ted was the forefront of that. Ted was so humble and and so introspective and just taking a lot of a lot of things from him. Uh, will help me as I move forward in my career. How would you define the Packer way? I'm sorry? How would you define the Packer way? It's something we've heard about the, over the course of the last month or so, but what is that to you? Yeah, the Packer way um, to me is just sort of a draft and develop, um, extend your core performers from within. Um, and, and again, it's about it's about honesty, respect, and treating people the right way. Do you feel like with the transfer portal, are more reps and more scheme exposure, is that a net benefit? Or like, how are you kind of interpreting all the quarterbacks that are coming out now under these new? In terms of quarterback specifically? Um, I don't know that I would say it's a benefit or a hindrance. Like I think every, every person, every situation is different. Um, I think there's something to be said for somebody that's grown and developed in the same scheme for four years or five years. And I also think, you know, there's something to be said for someone who has had those different exposures and has had to deal with that adversity of changing schemes and changing staff. So I think I think it's an individual based answer. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's bring in our boots on the ground, our man on the scene. It's Phil Perry out in Indianapolis. Great job by the media, I thought. There'll always be some nitpicking. <laughs> but I thought that you guys covered a lot of ground. I want to ask you about the number one takeaway that I concluded with in my intro before we heard from Elliot, and that is that there is so much differentiating going on between the Patriots of 2024 and the Bill Belichick way of doing things. It's almost overt and it's bordering on disrespectful. <laughs> it's getting there. I don't know. Is it just me? Cause I'm, I'm not sitting there next to you and able to say, does that sound bad? I understand where you're coming from when you say that, because for, you know, Elliot Wolf, who in the local media scrum that he had after his podium session, um, when he was asked to describe 
the culture that they're shooting for in New England, he used words like open, treating people the right way, mm. you know, and if, if that's what their goal is to differentiate, you are thereby implying that people weren't treated the right way here in New England. He said, we're going to have less of a hard ass type of, I'm going to try to find the quote for it right now because I just tweeted it. And While you look saw, for it, he also concluded, saw this one. He also concluded say, when asked at the podium, what, what's the Packer way? Honesty, respect, and treating people the right way. Phil, what, what did he say in the side? Yeah, that's. I asked him about the Packer way because there were so many Packers questions and the, the grading system, Tom, has changed that for the fo real football nerds, I think is a big takeaway because the, Stacking the system, is out. The grading system was, was complicated here. And it was color coded and numbered, and there were decimal points involved, and there were letters, lowercase letters, and capital letters. We've been over an ad nauseum on the next Pats podcast exactly what a player's grade could look like. And if you were coming in from the outside and you'd never seen that before, your head might explode. <laughs> and so I think the goal is to make things a little bit more simple. But then, in terms of the culture, Elliot did say with the local media, certainly there's more of an open, less of a hard ass type vibe in the building. And I've heard the same thing from, um, you know, just last night from people who have been in the building, you know, you'll hear, you'll hear music coming from an office or two uh, at Gillette stadium while people are doing their work. And it's just, it, it wasn't like that before. And so I think for, for some people who are used to the Bill Belichick way of doing things, it is a, it's a drastic change. It doesn't sound all that crazy, but I, I think that's, how it should be described. Yeah. And I'm sure the people who are, and I think that the large majority of Patriots fans right now are very circumspect about the direction of the team. As much as had Bill Belichick stayed, there would be a large majority who felt uncomfortable with Bill continuing with the rebuild. I think that there's always going to be a dissatisfied majority that you hear from when a team goes four and 13. And right now they're just hoping that it's not dance party USA and two and 15. Um, Phil, Give me a few takeaways from all of it. Just just roll through them because I already kind of did, and then I'll circle back on some other stuff. Well, I, I, I do feel as though, you know, it's interesting. They, they're trying to keep their cards uh, close to their chest when it comes to what they're going to do with the number three overall pick, and they have options, and they, they do need to get to know these guys to a degree. And I tried to ask Elliot Wolf about how important this week is just so – Elliot Wolf, Gerard Mayo, they can have an opportunity to interact one on one with Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May. Um, you know, I asked Elliot specifically if he feels as though you can you can almost gauge a player's resiliency level or mental toughness in a, in meetings like these, and he said probably not. That's going right. to be more talking to people who know them best and have known them for a long time and how they handle certain adverse situations whether it's about gauging mental toughness or anything else, Tom, th this process this week is huge for them because if they are going to invest that third pick in one of these guys, that's going to set the course for their franchise for the next several years. So they're going to want somebody who has an air about them that they feel uh, can lead a team. If not yeah. a one very soon. What do you glean from the comment that when the Patriots, uh, when Wolf says, we need someone that can elevate teammates and someone they quote, want to play for also adding, that they don't spend a shit ton of time on body language, but they don't want someone throwing their hands up. Yeah. Oh, Macaroo. That <laughs> sounded a lot like Mac Jones when you don't want somebody who throws their hands up when things go poorly or physically pointing at people after plays. Yes. I mean, that's to a <laughs> It's like putting up a video of things not to do. <laughs> this is what we don't want right here. <laughs> yep, that. Oh, and that too. And the F-bombs, yeah, on national TV? No, we don't want that either. Quick game. Don't ask for it by, <laughs> by name. At the same time, he said, you know, he was asked specifically about Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi. He said, hey, I'm glad, you know, you asked about those guys and we haven't made any decisions yet as far as the quarterback position goes. And um, everything's on the table. He said that multiple times when it came to that position. I asked him later in the local portion of his um, availability today if it was a good idea to drop a young quarterback into a situation where it looks like there are a lot of roster holes. And the way he put it was he's hoping that they have a lot of those holes, not just spackled over, but, but filled with really talented players. And so there's a lot of time he emphasized between now and the draft mm -hmm. to be able to resolve some of those situations that I was alluding to. 
thereby making it a better situation, quote unquote, for whoever that young quarterback might be. But so does that it, mean it attack mode he, in free agency? Say it one more time. Does that mean it's going to be attack mode in free agency? Yeah, it's got to be. They got cash to burn. I'm sorry if people are watching this on YouTube. You're going to see me fidgeting quite a bit. Phil's in a in catcher's my, crouch. In my catcher's stance. There's no good lighting here in this big media um, room that we're in right now. And I got my computer on a high chair. And so I am doing my best uh, Tony Pena right now. I've got one leg kicked out. Oh, you out. got the leg kicked out? Yeah. That's Snap throw to first, right quick. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> she almost, almost went down there. there. Um, it, it is going to be attack mode, I think. And, 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 he didn't say that. He didn't use the cash to burn phrase that Gerard Mayo used. But he understands that they need help. I mean, there was one portion of one answer where he was asked about the culture. And he said, it's easy for me to say that the culture has changed, but we've got no players here now. <laughs> and I think what he meant was there are no players in the building, Tom. But the way I took it is the team's going to have a totally different look in the fall. And so you know, what is the culture if the players aren't even he the players that are going to be making up that culture aren't even here yet? That's how I put like not even on the roster. So um, my guess is, and we know this because they have to get to a spending floor, Tom, they're going to be spending and spending a lot. What did you make of the Mike Unwenu, Kyle Duggar commentary, especially and specifically the, we will work with Kyle agents and with Mike. Did that catch your ear? Well, Mike is representing himself right yeah, now. Yeah, awesome. I think that's great. Uh, lot until... to be said. If you know what your landing spot is, you don't need an agent to stand there and take their three, five, six, nine, whatever percent. Now there is, you know, there is a mandatory window um, required by the league. If you move on from your agent and you want to hire another one, there's a five day, I believe, uh, buffer period that you have to allow to elapse. So maybe he is going to hire somebody, Tom, and he just sent his email to the league a few days ago saying that he doesn't have an agent right now. Um, so maybe he will have representation here soon. But the, it, what stood out to me was Elliot saying something that was, in, that was in contrast to an ESPN report from a few weeks ago. I don't know if you remember this. It was Jeremy Fowler, who's great at his job. And I like being around him, and he's here you know, this week, and he's tremendous. Tell him I but said, he, hey. <laughs> but he did say in, in a notes column that uh, the Patriots essentially know they're they're going to have no shot at bringing him back or something along those lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and um, that to me is not what Elliot said today. He's, well, you he's know what? It, it actually, now that you really dig down and, and maybe use a little bit of thought on that. So where would that come from? Where are most of our national writers who we enjoy to a large extent, some of which we enjoy less than others, their information comes from agents. That's why they get shit first, because they spend all their time on the phone talking to agents who have agenda-laden ways of communicating. And if there's a report out there from a national guy that says Mike Unwin, who's got no shot at returning to the Patriots, he's not talking to Mike Unwin said national individual, he's probably having something passed on to him by the agents. No disrespect to speculate on Jeremy's contacts, but it's it's our beat and we spend all our time on it. So when you drop something in here, we're going to go through it. Sorry. It's just the way it works. You parachute it in. You get it right, you get it wrong, you're going to get it looked at one way or the other. So I'm guessing that came from on when who's agent and Mike on when who's when said, what the what what did you why did you say that so maybe we got the smoking gun for why he's got a new agent um hey what the hell here's another one here's another one with the differentiation we're gonna play young players and develop from within so that means no more detentions for guys fumbling unlimited fumbles no i'm kidding but <laughs> what did you, what'd you make of that one yeah i thought that was interesting too uh, and and Listen, I understood why for the last several years of Tom Brady's career, and I can remember, Tom, having specific conversations with the league people here at the Combine about how the Patriots were building their team late in Tom Brady's tenure, and it was unlike any other, where they were really going in on these middle-tier veterans who were more expensive than rookies but not stars, mm -hmm. and they were praised for that because it was an untapped market to a degree, 
And so you could get your David Andrews's and your Lawrence guys and your James White's, and you could pay these guys more than a rookie would, would be paid, but get better play and more consistent play out of them to make the most of Tom Brady's window. But that sort of thing has to go out the window when you don't have a quarterback who's in his forties anymore and one of the best in football, you have mm-hmm. to, to build that. And that's what they're in the middle of. They have been, and it felt like they didn't want to acknowledge it for a while in order to build. You have to be willing to develop younger guys and whether it's pop Douglas or, you know, even somebody like Kendrick Bourne, who is a free agent and he's not a, you know, he's not a kid by any stretch, but why is, why is he in the doghouse? Just so you could play who, you know, just so Nelson, we learned his lesson. two years ago is Nelson Aguilar and, John, I don't know. It, you know, couldn't even get on the field. Yeah, but it's interesting because, you know, I think that probably Bill himself would look at the 2014 to 2019 litany of, and even going back further, Taylor Price or Aaron Dobson and say, you know, we bring these guys in and Tom won't throw to them if they don't know exactly what they're doing. And that might have been something Bill's like, well, you know what? He's not going to get any more tolerant of young players. Look at how he is with Harry. He won't even freaking look at him and he's pissed at Myers here and there. These guys need to develop. That's another reason we need to get a younger quarterback. Plus, he's 44. How good could he be? But then they still adhered to that a little bit, and they still did have kind of a penal system in place for the mistakes. Now, not just the fumbles, which is in in the vein of Demario Douglas, because I think that that's a specific and good example for what Wolf is talking about with playing young players and developing from within. Had a good first game. I wrote my roster reset on wide receivers. You'll see that, folks, because you're always on NBCSportsBoston.com. Four catches for 40 yards in the opener. Then he fumbled and played just eight snaps against Miami. And the fumble was not really a carelessness fumble. Well, he played like 17 snaps, 18 snaps, 30 snaps in the next three games and fell into disuse and into detention. Then when he came out, he had an outstanding season. Demario Douglas, ladies and gentlemen, was third in the NFL in yards after the catch by average behind Debo Samuel and Rasheed Rice. If you had 40 or more catches, the only guys better after the catch than Demario Douglas were Debo Samuel and Rasheed Rice. And he sat there and festered for virtually half the season because of a fumble against Miami. However, one of those picks against the Giants, Phil, that Mac threw to seal his fate was Demario Douglas running the wrong route. So, Fits and starts. Your reaction to any of that? I just babbled longer than I intended to, and then we'll get one more question. We're out of here. Yeah, I, I want to, you know, just highlight something that Wolf said about the offense. He wants to weaponize the offense. Yeah. To me, they are so they were and have been so devoid of real weapons that has to be a major focus for them, and you know how they allocate these resources is is going to matter to me what makes sense is spending on linemen and then hammering the draft with the, the shinier toys and, and hoping that you can allow those guys to, to grow together at quarterback and receiver and, mm-hmm. and in a couple of years really have something. And he was asked his last question uh, with the local reporters was what would you deem to be a successful season? And he essentially said progress. You know, awesome. he, he, they want to contend for the postseason. He did mention something along those lines. He said, we're not going to shy away from that, but it's more about showing progress. And that I think is the right approach right now. He didn't give us any sort of uh, timeline in terms of the runway that he thinks he has, you know, is this going to be a two year rebuild, a three year rebuild, a five year rebuild? It was nothing along those lines, but it was, we want to see progress and that's what it should be, you know, but it has to be real progress. It can't just be real progress in, in a couple of different spots. It has to be big picture progress. Yeah. It's like, you know what, you know, what was um, phantom progress? The Patriots beating the Steelers and the Broncos in 2023, 21 to 18 and whatever it was against the Broncos. That was phantom 2023 progress. They didn't get better as the season went along and the rug got pulled out. Now you can have a four win team or a five win team or a six win team that does show progress. And anybody wondering if that's true, I'll take you back to 1993, ladies and gentlemen. And I close with this. They had the first overall pick at quarterback. They had a coach in Bill Parcells. That team started the season 1-11 and with Scott Seacules on the center. <clears throat> By the end of the year, I was watching in Southie on closed-circuit television as they went up against, I can't remember what team, 
but in the snowbank lined Schaefer Stadium, Foxborough Stadium. Michael Timpson scored from Bledsoe to lift the team to a 5 and 11 final record. And Dan Deardorff said, I don't think this team's going to lose another game. Actually, that was the last game of the year. He might have said that in week 12. But that team was on the verge of moving to friggin' St. Louis. And it's a very interesting history as we're watching with the dynasty. But Phil, now I'm riffing and you're in a casual squat and you don't need to listen to all of it. I want you in bed earlier tonight. Why do you say that? Because I think you flew out there late. And I think that when you get into a, a work situation, you do what you're supposed to do, which is to do the job. So you know that the job in Indianapolis is got to get out there and talk to people. All right. I need you sharp. I'm not saying you're not sharp. It feels like you're saying I'm not sharp. No, you're wholly sharp, Mm -hmm. but you need to pick your spots. I don't care if you take a nap or what. Pick your spots. Okay. I could could grab, I could grab like a five minute nap right under this podium right here. I'm at podium uh, like eight right now. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see that I know my guy? Because I can tell I I actually nailed it. He is a little tuckered. All right, Phil. I feel good. I feel fresh. I'm excited. It is. It's exciting as hell. That's the, the other thing good, I was going to say. There are number of Patriots people here too, Tom, you know, and they're out and about. And so a uh, little bit different already. It feels like after just one day uh, here in Indy, just in terms of how available some of these guys are. Not so, even one day, folks. It's just hours into the national scouting combine. Um, enjoy, bud. Uh, appreciate you. Appreciate your work. I, I, this is going to be a period of time that we look back on. Um, for a long time this 2024 offseason because it is going to be a landmark time. I'm, I'm recalling 1993 with ease because that was a landmark time as well. Through Bledsoe and Chris Slade. I win! <laughs> <laughs>